Everyone joins in late. We are recording this uh, this session as we do with all of our, our webinars. And uh, um, so if, if someone misses something at the beginning, they can always come back and, and hear that. My name is Daniel Johnson. I'm the Chief Operations Group. It is my pleasure to, uh, to uh, host this webinar with uh, Jennifer Silverman of uh, Hilton Worldwide. I had uh, the fortune uh, to hear Jennifer speak um, at a, uh, earlier this year at, uh, at an, an event called One Step Forward, How Companies Can Join the Fight Against Human Trafficking. It was held uh, here in Atlanta at, uh, at Delta. Delta was the host of that event. And uh, Jennifer shared um, some, of the, uh, some of the activities and things that, that she is doing and her team at Hilton Worldwide on the subject of human trafficking. So, um, so I asked Jennifer to speak at, uh, for this webinar, and she so uh, graciously accepted. Uh, just, just as an FYI, again, if you, if you choose to read to hear this um, webinar or any of the other webinars that, that we have in the webinar series. They're all available on the video library page uh, on the Venture Group website. So we have a number of webinars, everything from, from uh, EII to PTI compliance to uh, I-9 com uh, compliance and performance management, um, performance improvement rather, um, from, from some of the leaders in the hospitality industry. So we we welcome you definitely to attend or to, to review those those webinars that are all available um, on our website. So again, I want to uh, um, introduce Jennifer and thank uh, thank her for for being um, graciously uh, agreeing to be our our facilitator today. Um, Jennifer Silverman is the vice president for corporate responsibility. Um, at Hilton Worldwide, and uh, uh, Ms. Sil, I would just read some a little bit on her bio. Ms. Silverman joins Hilton Worldwide from APCO Worldwide for eight years as vice president in the corporate responsibility practice. She counseled Fortune 500 companies and global foundations on strategy and, and program design, measurement, stakeholder engagement, reporting, and results-oriented philanthropy. She has more than 20 years of experience working in, the U working in the U.S. and throughout Latin America and Africa, areas of economic development, ability, human rights, women's empowerment, and youth opportunity. So again, thank you so much, Jennifer. I hand over the center rights to you. Um, uh, it was yours. Oh, one, one thing I do request is those on the phone, if you could please mute your phones so we don't get any background noise and we can hear. Uh, everything that Jennifer shares. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, it'd be great. Jennifer, the, uh, it's all yours. Well, great. Can everybody see my screen, hopefully? Yep, we can see it. Great. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Daniel, for that introduction. And thanks again for inviting Hilton Worldwide to share um, our experiences and, and certainly working to um, educate and inform um, you know, our team members and the traveling public. So today I just like to walk you through um, you know the, the way that we Everyone, if you wouldn't mind muting your telephone so that we don't get any background noise. Thank you. Great. And now for some I can't go to slide shows. What's going on there? Hmm. Jennifer, by chance, do you have your telephone and your audio? Um, Sorry? No, I just have the audio of the computer. I mean, audio of the so telephone. We do have, have a couple of other folks with their audio on. If you wouldn't mind muting your telephone, um, that, would be, that would be great so we don't get that, that crazy echo sound. Thank you. Great. 
So today what I wanted to walk you through is certainly how a global hospitality company uh, is addressing this issue. Um, what we see as you know, size and scale, certainly the scope of the issue, um, to give you a little bit about some of the, um, I think some of the, the way that it does impact our business, and then talk to you about our approach and the training components that we have created for our, um, for our team members. So, you know, to do any kind of, of compliance training program, obviously in, in an environment that has over 300,000 team members, we're in over 90 countries, certainly the issue differ is in different national environments, certainly cultural issues, but I think, um, and, and the added complexity of an own managed franchise organization. So all of those things um, had to be considered as we were developing a training program that would allow us to meet the various needs of our team member constituents, but also address some of the ways that we wanted to make sure we could scale and certainly address the issue in as holistic ways as possible. For us, really, the turning point came about two and a half years ago. Um, we unfortunately became the target of a activist campaign that was led by Aves um, and was supported by other organizations around um, some issues that had taken place in our business environment markets outside of the United States. Um, but really they became a lightning rod uh, for um, a lot of the NGO community on asking hotel companies in particular to sign the ECPAC code of conduct and to address what that code of conduct would be and mean for our business. Um, previously, there had been some resistance uh, internally at the company on looking at other outside code of conduct and really working on a, a more collaborative dialogue with expat and certainly with some of the other activist organizations. But I think you know, the more and more we were able to look at this being a tool that could protect and enhance our reputation and really understanding what the expat code of conduct was asking for. And for those of you who you know, may not be aware, uh, the ECPAC code is really a code of six principles that really asks uh, the traveling tourism industry on how they will um, train and educate their team members, how they will communicate about their child protection code in a company policy or in a code of conduct, how they'll work with their suppliers, how they'll work with their guests and their consumers, and then how they'll measure and continuously improve. And all of those things were things that the company was fundamentally um, certainly in agreement with in principle and really wanted to work toward. Um, and so it became an opportunity for us to have a, a proactive dialogue. And so we signed the ECPAC Code of Conduct in 2011 and became the second US hospitality company to do so, multi-brand hospitality company to do so after Carlson, which has certainly been a, a great leader, I think, and role model for the industry overall. So let's talk a little bit about the scope of the issue. I think many of us know this already, but it is the second largest organized crime, and it's at $32 billion annually. So the size and scale of this is enormous, and there's a lot of different ways um, that a company could begin to tackle this. Um, you know, numbers vary, but there's estimated a very, you know, rough estimate at 27 million adults and children that are subject to the broad definition of trafficking, which again can include forced labor, bonded labor, and prostitution around the world. Um, I think what's even a scarier number is certainly that two, men, two million children are subject to prostitution in the global commercial sex trade. And just last year, um, you know, numbers at over 100,000 in the United States are, um, are victims. And the average entry of a child into prostitution is somewhere around 12 to 13 years old. Um, and obviously, prostitution is uh, an illegal activity, but it also, having sex with a minor under the age of 18, is illegal in the United States. So the fact that there are no 12 or 13 year old going into this by choice, but certainly um, it is a legal activity that takes place um, in communities throughout the United States. Um, and really what we see is that hotels can play an important role in the prevention and reporting of child prostitution and trafficking, and really being that eyes and ears and having that better understanding of the issue, because unfortunately, um, if connections 
tourism is fairly complex, and it certainly is, is a byproduct of the travel and tourism industry. Certainly not one we condone, but one that certainly takes place in our hotels around the world. And how do we better manage that from a safety and security perspective, but certainly from a child protection perspective? So how, again, how is it defined? And I talked about this just a minute ago, but you know, in the United States, a minor induced to commercial sex is a human trafficking victim. And a minor in the United States is under the age of 18 years. Um, you do not need to, you know, there are other uh, uh, things that you need to prove when you're talking about human trafficking, or fraud or coercion, and they are not required to establish child sex trafficking. And remember that minors cannot legally consent to sex or to any crime. So there is no such thing as a child prostitute messages for us to really communicate to our business partners and to our hotels that, again, whether we thought we were you know, looking the other way or not managing an issue, we are condoning or allowing an illegal activity to take place in our hotels if we are not educating and informing our team members on how best to address the issue. And again, um, obviously many of you that certainly work in hotels or, or certainly support hotels, no hotel wants to be a, a, an accomplice to any kind of illegal activity that would take place and certainly does not want to put its guests or its team members in harm's way. And so that really for us was the business case on how we could really begin to implement um, our awareness and training program. And at the end of the day, in certain states are much uh, stricter on their uh, uh, offenses but that there are you know, minimum prison sentences of 10 to 15 years. Of course, uh, we all know that it's fairly hard often to find the perpetrators, to find the pimps um, that are working on these issues. But overall, um, I'll, you know, it, it's definitely something where, again, it's an illegal activity. I thought this was just uh, an interesting slide. We use this in our training programs, and it's pretty impactful to, to just sort of see how pimps talk about the issue and what are they looking for and just how pervasive it is. So, you know, I wanted very pretty girls and young because they took orders. Most were 16 to 17. You know, any player can tell when a girl has a look of desperation that she knows is attention or love. It's something you start to have a sick sense about. So really, you know, targeting vulnerable girls. A lot of times these are runaways. Um, they're girls that perhaps um, have been kicked out of their homes because maybe they're in an abusive family relationship, maybe they're in an abusive relationship overall. Um, LGBT teenagers are much more uh, vulnerable now um, just from feeling isolated, you know, either in their families and acceptance. So really playing on that possibility of, um, you know, of young people. Um, again, girls who ran away from or were put out by their parents, ladies who were pretty but we're on welfare dropouts, you know you can smell the desperation. So again, you know, I think these are just, um, you know, just to have these kinds of, you know, quotes and to see them, to see, to bring it to life. I know that for our team members, um, it's very impactful and certainly talks about, you know, really, uh, uh, um, you know, looking at these vulnerable situations and taking advantage of these, um, you know, of these young girls. This, again, is probably for us when we do our training programs is one of the, the scariest and the most impactful slides that really hits home for our team members. But when you think about some of these um, children that are being forced into these situations, you know, on average, they might have a five customer a night quota. Um, you know, and you look at what that looks like at seven days a week, one year, and how many forced sexual encounters this puts on to uh, a young child, right? Um, and I think that, you know, this is really something that, um, you know, the trauma that it creates, right, and what ultimately happens and how are these support networks created for these young girls or young boys if they are rescued and are able to become survivors. Um, so, you know, again, some of these things, and we certainly don't want to, you know, when we, when we talk to our team members about really you know, thinking about, you know, what is that trauma experience, but I think this really hits home and, you know, really puts it into context for them that, you know, nobody, certainly, again, from that safety and security perspective of our team members, of our guests, are contributing to this kind of, of trauma for a young person. 
So with all of that, um, you know, what did we look at when we were designing up our program? And it was really about a holistic approach, meeting those expat um, guidelines and guiding principles that I talked about earlier. So we have a global code of conduct. We explicitly talk about um, our policy um, against uh, the exploitation of children and in specifically the sexual exploitation of children. We also have compliance training that our team members have to um, take part in as a requirement on signing the code of conduct of where there are some points specifically on um, the part around human rights and the exploitation of children. So then we take it a step further and really bring it out to our hotel community. And that's where we look at team member awareness and trainings. Um, we've got general trainings that we do for our general managers and for department heads um, and department specific that then they can cascade into the department teams. Again, what housekeeping may see would be very different from concierge in the front desk, food and beverage. So really think about making our team members aware, where do they go for more information and what do they do with that information. And again, every company is different and the way we've approached it, it's really about looking at the, the lines of command or chain of command on how we report the legal activity in our business and compliance issues. And so it really follows whatever we normally do in compliance and legal training. And so it's a really easy way for our team members to understand that we're not asking them to make any phone calls on what they seek. We're asking them to go to their general manager, their manager on duty, and really report what they may have observed. And then that GM or manager on duty takes it from there. We're also supporting organizations that are building out public awareness campaigns to educate and inform the public about child trafficking and prostitution. Um, we support NGOs around the world, community organizations that work with survivors and in preventative programs. And you can see a couple of the examples below on who we work with and create really programs that are addressing those grassroots organizations that are working um, with survivors or certainly with vulnerable populations that could be at risk for trafficking and really trying to give them resources that they can build capacity to help uh, the young people before they could potentially be brought into um, child trafficking property. And then we participate in several industry and business coalitions. So. Um, I'll talk about those in a minute, but the overview of our training program, um, again, as I talked about earlier, which we direct to our general managers, our manager on duties, um, you know, and specific department heads, and then we, we streamline and cascade for the various departments, is really providing the local context first and foremost. Um, we want to really dispel that myth early on that this takes place in Thailand or Cambodia only. It is a global problem, and so we provide information. So for example, in the United States, we give them examples of things that are happening in their own cities and backyards um, and at the state level and where they can go for state and city resources. We define what human and child sexual trafficking are. We give them opportunities to see and recognize the signs of child sex trafficking, and then we break it up into the victims, the traffickers, and the customers. We talk about how to respond to potential situations. There are several scenarios that we give and, and role plays. Um, we train our staff then via our pre-shift and other huddle uh, communities that we have on property. And then we provide them with resources. So for example, in the United States, we provide what the National Human Trafficking Resource Center and hotline can do and how that's a resource for our hotel leadership teams and what to do should they encounter an issue. And then where are their legal and community resources that they can also be aware of should they need to get more information and better understand the context of what's happening in their local community. So there's a lot, I think, that the, the industry is certainly looking um, to really broaden its um, engagement and outreach um, on the issue. Uh, we work on several of these um, and certainly provide um, resources to help support. Um, one of the best things that was um, you know, released earlier this year was through the HNLA Foundation um, and the learning module that was designed by ECPAT um, on really what is the role of the hospitality industry to prevent and react to child trafficking. It's a very quick um, e-modular uh, training program that you can take. It's very uh, 
you know, cost uh, accessible. Um, if you're a member of AHNLA, you can do it for $20. If you're a non-member, you're able to take the um, training for free, and they also offer uh, licensing agreements if you're a larger organization. Um, U.S. Yeah. Travel has participated in providing lots of resources um, on mm -hmm. what it's doing and providing education and awareness on the issue in the United States. Uh, we're a member of an organization called the International Tourism Partnership, which is based in the UK, um, but has several of the global hospitality brands and airlines that are members. And again, talks about, um, you know, there are resources that are available um, from ITP members um, to uh, the broader community on child trafficking um, and awareness. Um, we've also participated, there's a Global Business Travel Association and others that have, you know, really leveraged their voice with meeting planners, with other organizations to educate um, their constituents on child trafficking. And we're seeing more and more requests for meeting planners and certainly from associations and business partners that are looking to see if um, companies have signed the, the code of conduct and what are they doing in this area as far as child trafficking. Faith-based organizations are incredibly, um, I think, active on this issue and certainly look to host their meetings in hotels and in organizations that ha are actively engaged on the issue. So there's also a business opportunity there to certainly um, work with the faith-based community as they look at um, organizations that are working on this issue. And then earlier this year, the World Travel Organization uh, uh, campaign on educating the public um, on you know what to do, what to see, what you see, and how to be a more engaged traveler um, on the issue. So again, there's a lot of great um, initiatives that are happening, and I think there are, are certainly more that I haven't identified um, uh, on, on ways that the industry can work together. And then lastly, the one in the middle is the Global Business Coalition Against Trafficking, which is a multi-sector organization. It's the organization that Daniel mentioned earlier that was hosting the event in Atlanta. And there they bring, um, you know, law firms, the IT community, uh, certainly hospitality, travel and tourism, um, the financial sector, et cetera, uh, uh, you know, global energy companies on really looking at um, ways that we can all work together by leveraging our industries and our shared um, opportunities to educate the public and certainly um, help redefine business practices and provide resources yeah, um, for other companies. So I'll, I'll just end with, you know, this is our CEO, Chris okay, Nassena, you, and, you know, it's certainly one of the reasons we have, um, you know, put our efforts behind child trafficking and really educating and, and engaging our team members, but also supporting organizations that are building capacity and certainly looking yeah. to end this um, this horrific crime against um, against children. So I guess with that, mm -hmm. I'll stop. And I know we have a few more minutes left for, for questions. I'm happy to answer any of those. Fantastic. Thank, um, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, so now would be now would be a good time to ask uh, ask some questions. I've uh, I've got a couple myself, but I want to open it up to the um, to the attendees. Does Does anyone have a have a question? If you'd like, maybe put your name in a um, in a uh, in the chat section, and then uh, um, then I can call on you. Or if if you just you got a question just burning, you want to just jump right in. That's that's fine as well. Questions. I, while while you're thinking of that, I have a question. So, Jennifer, did you you, you kind of touched on it a little bit at the beginning? Do you feel that there was much in the way of resistance to being involved on this subject within within Hilton? No, I I would not say there was resistance. I think the challenge was was like anything. Sometimes a um, an understanding or interpretation of what it means to sign an outside organization's code of conduct and what are you responsible for and what are you able to manage and measure. And so I think for me there were sort of two approaches. Um, and, you know, I talked about this when we were in Atlanta. But, you know, first and foremost, it was really working with our operators on the fact that at the end of the day this was an illegal activity. And any illegal activity compromises the safety and security 
security of your team members and your guests. And that's obviously, you know, for everybody in the room who's an operator, um, you know, that's a paramount uh, a concern and certainly um, one that is incredibly important in an organization like ours. So putting that into that context, I think, really got them to understand that, you know, at the end of the day, we have a responsibility that we have to educate our organization on what we need to know in order to ensure that this illegal activity is not taking place in our hotel. So that was, I would say, fairly easy for the business to understand. Um, you know, I think like anything, you know, legal certainly is risk averse and always wants to make sure that we're able to, um, you know, live up to codes and uh, initiatives that we sign and make sure that we're not putting the company at any kind of unintentional risk. And so, you know, it was certainly working with them to get them comfortable on what that, uh, uh, um, you know, what that was um, as far as, you know, making sure that we worked really collaboratively with ECPAT. We created a very measured action plan year on year. And so we really were about making sure that we sort of took a crawl, walk, run approach. And we were, you know, really working to not, certainly not over promise on what we could do, but making sure that we were able to deliver on those expectations, certainly, um, you know, certainly to the outside, um, to the outside world. So I see other questions. Daniel, should I just sort of go and, and try to begin to under, uh, answer those? Hello, Daniel? I was on mute, sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> I was okay. on mute as well. Um, yeah, please go right ahead and, uh, okay. and address, you got Natasha. Question yep, as well I as see Natasha's from. question. So, you know, Natasha, we what we do is really it's a little bit more the reverse. I wouldn't say that we've had, um, you know, a lot of where we've gotten notification of where this issue is is taking place. I mean, certainly there are instances of anything, as you can imagine, where law enforcement um, comes to you or there is something else that has transpired, and you need to work with the hotel on something that may be taking place on any kind of, of illegal activity. Usually what ends up happening is, again, we select our hotels based on, you know, uh, clusters in certain cities where we know maybe some of those cities are stacking up in um, where there are higher incidents that are being reported through um, the various federal law enforcement um, and, and where we also have strong GMs. I mean, I think that sometimes you certainly want your early adopters to be um, leadership that can help talk about why this is important and cascade it to their community. So usually what ends up happening is, you know, we select our, our properties, we do the training, and then we certainly continue to, to engage with them and making sure that we, we provide follow-on materials and everything else. But we have a very specific protocol on, again, how they would notify um, you know, law enforcement should um, there be an issue that was taking place in their hotel. And where we have, um, have been alerted of something, we certainly take those on a case-by-case -case basis working through our you know, safety and security team, our ops team, and legal, et cetera, just like we would on any other kind of issue that compromises um, the safety and security of our guests and team members, and that is an illegal activity. So I'll go to the next question. Um, so our biggest operational challenges in combating trafficking. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I think probably the biggest operational challenge is just continuing to you know, educate that, you know, that this is something that takes place in our backyard communities, whether we want to, you know, whether we, we see or know that, you know, uh, I think, again, you've got different levels of understanding. I mean, it's, it's interesting that as we started to work with our hotels and more and more, you know, we hear from team members, you know, I, I had an instance once where I thought something and I didn't know what to do and now it's great that I've got these resources or I've seen something in the news and I've also also wondered. So sometimes it was just connecting the dots for them that, wow, this isn't something that is just taking place, in, again, outside of my hotel community or outside of the United States. And it certainly has been um, something that is, um, you know, unfortunately, 
an incident that, that can happen anywhere. Um, you know, again, I'd say the, the operational challenges are really, and, and the way we designed it is we put it into compliance training on any other kind of compliance issues that we have to go through with our hotels based on different, um, you know, issues that take place. So we've got several initiatives that we have to do under compliance training, um, you know, that are requirements for the hotel. So by putting it into that context and really, again, reminding them over and over again about the, the ability that it can, you know, compromise the safety and security and at the same time it is an illegal activity, we usually don't get a, a lot of pushback, and in fact, we usually get really positive feedback afterwards on how helpful it is. And some of these things have helped them in recognizing other types of illegal, illegal activities taking place in the hotel. So I would say overall, I just think greater awareness um, continues to need to, to happen um, at an industry-wide level. And again, that we play a really important role in you know, welcoming tens of millions of guests every year to our hotel, and so what can we do to, to help educate and inform? Excellent. I, quick question. Um, you were mentioning the train, you know, the, that you conducted training, the events group is in, in, in this training. I'm just curious what types of interventions, you mentioned the ECPAT um, training module. is. It, when you roll, when you were rolling out the training, what kind of interventions did you utilize? Was it mostly face-to-face -face training at uh, at the property level? Was it a, was it done via virtual webinars? Um, yeah, no. So a couple job. things. First of all, uh, yeah, we don't use. So the EPCAT training is an online training now that is available and anyone can use. We actually designed our training program with Polaris who runs the National Human Rights or Human Trafficking Hotline. So we really did a customized training based on, you know, what our learning and development and compliance team knew would be um, a good way to deliver the training. And then Polaris was our subject matter expert in, in really creating the content um, and putting it into, you know, a, a Hilton Worldwide curriculum. Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, right now, for the most part, we do the first instance is a face-to-face -face training. And, you know, again, as we continue to scale up and leverage our franchises and, and others, you know, we, we certainly, that's not a scalable solution. But we have found that because of the heavy, you know, content, certainly, and, and the material, it's often really uh, much better for the trainers to work in the initial uh, uh, training portion face-to-face -face and deliver it. So again, often they'll deliver it as part of other training work that they're doing already with the hotel. As I mentioned earlier, we sort of bundle it together um, so it becomes part of a, a broader program. And then certainly follow up and other things we can do, you know, via updates and webinars and those kinds of things. I mean, again, we're exploring different ways because obviously to go to, to scale in our organization or to provide resources, we get a lot of requests. I mean, certainly a lot of our management companies have actually done, I mean, some great work. With several of them have signed the ECPAT Code of Conduct, um, so we're really um, thrilled to, you know, to have such great management and owning companies that also are seeing the, the importance of this issue. But we've also had a lot of, um, you know, requests from our franchisees, and so how do we provide resources for them should they want to look at, um, you know, offering training? And again, that's where I think some of the HNLA training component work is, is quite helpful. So. Any other any other questions? Um, this is not a question, but more of a comment. I I, I, uh, I, no, I noticed how you referenced um, the, the the fact that child prostitution is not doesn't exist. It's uh, it's uh, you know it's, it's Victims of uh, sexual exploitation. Um, interesting that that you you know you reference the different language, di different nomenclatures that that might be um, you know for some might have a different context. So was that something that you worked with the Polaris group to to identify? Is that something that they they in a way that they contributed 
Um, there yeah, are and all that language, I mean, all that material information they have very transparently on their, um, on their website. But yeah, I mean, it's not even Polaris, the definition. I mean, that is basically the definition of, you know, the U.S. government. And so really how we define human trafficking, how we define child sexual exploitation, prostitution, et cetera. So they just helped us. And again, I sort of cut and pasted a few of the slides, but again, in those early parts of our training where I talk about defining human trafficking, defining child tra sex trafficking, it's very explicitly called out for our team members to understand the differences and what we're specifically talking about for the purpose of this training. Great. Well, um, we're about six minutes over our, our, our time, and I know everyone has busy schedules. Are there any other uh, other questions that you may have? Anyone else uh, from the from the uh, attendees? We do uh, we do appreciate you attending our, our hospitality webinar series, and um, and most sincerely, thank you so much, Jennifer, for preparing preparing the slide deck and the time it took to uh, to get yourself uh, ready to to present to us. It's certainly uh, certainly appreciated. So unless we have any other questions, um, I uh, I'll, I'll thank everyone for their attendance. Um, share the share the link. I will be sending the links out to, with to to access to this webinar once it's uh, once we post it this afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions about our webinar series uh, for hospitality, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but uh, unless there's any other comments, I thank you all for attending, and and most sincerely thank you. Jennifer for, for presenting. No, thank you. We appre I appreciate it. And feel free to you know reach out to me if there's any questions regarding what I presented today. So yes, I can share. Actually, um, I can share um, Jennifer's contact information. Um, I'll put that on the screen now. Sorry, it's the there's, there's Jennifer's uh, email address. That is correct, is it not? Yep. Okay, great. So you can reach out uh, to Jennifer or reach out to me if you, if need be. Thank you again for your attendance, everyone. Have a have a terrific day, and uh, um, we'll see you next time. Great. Thanks so much.